So she's described as grey-eyed. And what does that mean? That means the, the faraway eyes, the, the vision, the sight. And her sight is, it's foresight, uh, sight into the future, but it's also insight, which we'll deal with in a minute. So she has a, so she's got vision, essentially. <laughs> she's got the vision thing that George W. Bush, was it George W.? No, it's the other one. George Bush said that he didn't have was he had a problem with the vision thing. So the reason I bring up Joan of Arc is because um, she is obviously an avatar of Athena. In, you know, she's, she's dressed as Athena. And her story is quite interesting because it involves this idea of um, military, nationalism, um, and vision and she has all those three themes in her life so this the story of Joan of Arc is that she was a peasant girl who started to have visions um, this was when France was torn between it was uh, war torn um, and Britain England rather England had a lot of France along with Burgundy and then there were the French on the other side and she was over in Lorraine is that right? She was over in, uh, in Eastern France and she started to have visions. Uh, I think the first person who came to her was St. Michael, but then she changed to St. Anne and St. Catherine, is it? Eventually, she had two female um, sa uh, saints who were coming to her, but initially it was St. Michael, who's also quite Pallas Athena-ish with his shield and his sword. So he seems to be having the same stuff. And yesterday was his feast day. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and um, uh, where was I? So she has these visions. She goes to, nobody believes her, right? Even though she, except for some of the local, the local Lord, who does believe her a bit. And eventually they believe her and they take her to see the Dauphin, the heir to the throne. And they don't believe her initially, and then they do believe her because she says, I must lead, you must go to Orléans. You, I must lead the, you know, we must go back there, we must lead the troops, and we'll win, we'll have victory. Anyway, it all transpires, as she said. Um, her visions turn out to have been completely correct. And this is, is it a myth or is it the truth? You know, did this really, you know, it's history that I'm talking about. Um, she's in every church in France, except in Burgundy, um, where they're not so keen on her, but you know, you go in and there she is. And what's interesting when you go into a church and you're looking at all these saints and there's all these ladies with long things, looking there, and then suddenly there's this boyish girl with wearing armor. Um, and in the Odyssey, uh, Pallas at one point appears to Telemachus as a boy. She comes as a man. So she's not, and she's, she's dressed in drag, you know, she's basically dressed as a, as a guy a lot of the time. The same with Joan of Arc. Anyway, Joan of Arc was burned as a witch by the English in the end. But that, those three themes there, um, and, but France was saved in a way. I mean, there were, they had to go on fighting further but that was the turning point. Um, so there's three. There's the idea of the nation, of patriotism. There's the idea of this person who has a vision. Um, and again, she's uh, so she's got Pallas Uranus in Aquarius, and I think the Pallas Uranus that's a, that's a crazy kind of vision thing. It's someone with this uh, who's thinking in a completely different way. And she's thinking into the deep future, maybe, with Uranus. Um, so we've got the vision, and we've got the mil military thing. She goes into battle. Yeah, She's not like some great strategist or anything. She doesn't have, her only strategy is that we have to go to Orléans. You know? She doesn't ha really have a strategy, but she's still wearing the armor. And what is the armor saying, really? I think that's just something to put in your to think about is what does it mean that there's armor or that there's, she's wearing a helmet? Um, 
she doesn't have, Athena doesn't have the usual kind of feminine power of hair, which is, you know, one of our powers is our hair, um, said the Leah rising. Yes, <laughs> we have hair power, but she hides it. She puts it under the helmet. It's not like Pluto's helmet. So I was thinking about helmets, and part of this talk is just you're following my train of thought when I was thinking about weaving my way through um, thinking about Athena and thinking about what it might mean and how we would find her. So you, when you start um, thinking about these asteroids, you go on a hunt. Yeah, you have concepts, you go on a hunt, and you ask yourself questions. So I was interested with the generals. There are a lot more as well, by the way. I just thought we'd get a bit bored of talking about generals in World War II. Uh, I thought we might be more interested in this, which is, uh, well, this is Kate Aidy, Martha Gellhorn, uh, Orla Guerin, Lise Doucette, Marie Colvin, uh, um, Amanpour, and Lindsay Lohan, okay? Um, these are all war correspondents. They are, Lindsay, the, look at them. Some of them are actually dressed as Athena. This, this one, Lindsay Lohan, Lohan is dressed as Athena. She's dressed as Athena. Actually, so is Gellhorn. They're dressed in the helmet. They're in the war zone. What are they doing? They're there and they're looking with the gaze. They're, look, they're not fighting. They've gone to look and they've gone to report uh, the truth. Yeah? And so you're saying, so what? But listen to this. This is just when I, again, this is just what I was thinking about it and I thought I'm going to look this up. Okay? Um, and I don't want to get all their charts up because that's too boring. But I will just tell you what's happening with um, Pallas in their charts. And this follows on from something Faye was saying about vocation and the sun, okay? So Martha Gellhorn, who was a great war correspondent in World War II and in the Sp Spanish Civil War, she was the only correspondent to actually get to D-Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was there. The rest of them were kind of stuck on a boat. Um, she was there, she was at D-Day. Um, and she was an incredibly brave woman, and she was a war correspondent her whole life. She had a Sun Palace conjunction. Colvin, uh, Marie Colvin here, who was killed in Homs, Sun Palace conjunction. Lindsay Logan, Lo Logan, uh, is that her name? Yes, Sun Palace conjunction. Lise Doucette has a palace conjunct the North Node. Um, and Lise Doucette has a palace conjunct the North Node and it's tried by Chiron, which I think is in interesting. She's very simpatico to people. Kate Aidy had a palace sextile Venus in Leo. And I don't know, I haven't got the picture. Oh yeah, I have got the picture of her. She's dressed in the flak jacket. I don't know if you remember her during the Iraq war. She's dressed in the flak jacket. Um, so it's interesting that the um, palace Venus uh, you get the outfits, you know, you remember them in these outfits. Um, Orla Guerin, palace conjunct Venus, and there she is again, you know, so this is a woman with a helmet and a flat jacket. Um, and and um, Amanpour has palace in Aries opposite Jupiter, trine Mercury. Um, so, case made, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, great strategist. Um, great Yes, great strategist. But the, the strategy that we're interested in, because I think that that is the, um, it's the brain, you know, it's the mind. But also that these guys are not, it's, it's not just about the mind. What are they, what is it about them? When I started researching this, I was thinking, what is it about these people? Because it's incredibly brave what they're doing. And that's another thing facet of um, Pallas Athena is bravery. That's why she can teach heroes. Why, why is she the teacher of heroes? She shows them how to be brave. And how to be brave is not going and, you know, being like Mars. It's, oh, well, it can be. That's one kind of brave. But another kind of brave is to be uh, cool, calm, detached, but there, engaged at the same time. 
detached so and engaged. Aware of your opposition, but going for it with yes. Bob wouldn't have been. No, he wouldn't. And these guys, they're not even in opposition, are they? That's what's interesting as well. They're observing, almost in the same way that Pallas is like with the Odyssey, except she decides she likes Odysseus. But, you know, they're um, observers. Anyway, so I did <coughs> bring one of the charts, did I? Yeah, I brought Martha Gellhorn just to show you that I'm not making it up. Um, <laughs> there it is. Yeah, so this is a noon chart, but you know, that's not going to change that much. It might even be tighter. Um, and Scorpio, of course, is one of the signs of war. So what did she do? She spent her life as an observer and reporter on war. Um, that's quite simple. Uh, and it's interesting that it's opposite the moon in uh, Taurus. Does anybody have any comments on this chart? Uh, don't forget that it's actually a noon chart, so the right ascendant isn't doing it. Up. No, it doesn't say one o'clock. It says oh oh. It's a midnight chart. Oh one. That's why the sun's at the bottom. So it's not a, it's not the real time. Um, so, uh, but she's got um, Jupiter in Virgo, of course. She's a writer. Um, and the Jupiter is making a very nice little sextile to. Uh, the Sun uh, Palace. Um, it's, it's a tight conjunction. What were they all? They're all tight. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. I don't bother with really wide ones. Yeah. I can't. You know, th I'm talking to, uh, <laughs> zero degree between zero and four degrees, okay. mostly. You know, so I don't. Uh, just in general, you know, during this talk, these are not wide. I'm not. I don't. Um, when you're hunting, yeah. When you're doing a hunt yeah. through astrology, you might as well use a tight orb. Yeah. yeah? Otherwise, why? You know, it, it, you could have anything. Um, so, what have I got next? No. Do you know what? Well, I started off looking at Morse correspondence <coughs> in general, mm -hmm. and I found that so many of them were women. And I just thought, okay, well, I'll just do women. Because actually, all the ones who started to spring to mind, this is not, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think, who is a really famous male? Oh, the one who counted them all out and counted them back again. Who was that? Ah, in the Falklands. Oh, Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy. Yeah. 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 Pilger in Vietnam. I'm sure there are other ones. But see, Brian Hanrahan, that's what I'm thinking. you guys are seeking, aren't you? Yeah. Whereas if I say Orla Guerra and Lise Doucette to you, boom, you know who I'm talking about. You know, and even Martha Gellhorn. And it's, there's something about that female presence in the midst of war that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that does seem to be archetypal as well. You know, because you have, I, I'm just thinking of, you know, the battlefield of Chor. You've got these terrible things, all these, you know, blood and guts everywhere. And Pallas and Helena walking through it in her golden sandals. Um, Okay, I'm on Martha Gilhorn. And then, okay, then I th was thinking, okay, as I was thinking about systems. Now, this is a bit of a surprise. We get to Charles Dickens. It's a leap. <laughs> However, Game and Game of Thrones, exactly. Well, I was thinking about Game of Thrones, and I was thinking about generals and observation. I was thinking, who has to marshal huge, huge numbers of characters and huge numbers of people and think about them and then structure an entire society and invent a system um, and get it all working together, right? Well, authors obviously do, but a certain kind of writer has to do that. Um, not all of them do that. Dick Dickens did, you know. He d wrote those big fat books with a million characters and got them all kind of interacting and doing different stuff. There's also, and he's got it all, you know, there it is. Yeah. It's in um, Sagittarius for Dickens. So it's very wide ranging, his Athena, and he's able to observe all levels of society. I think it's one of the interesting things about him. But he's not the only one. 
George R. R. Martin. Has anybody watched, been watching Game of Thrones? <coughs> you have. Uh, how many characters are there in there? How much happens? How much war? How much, you know, it's really complicated, isn't it? Um, and you do kind of think, well, he must have an, an incredible giant grid. And this is an, a palacy thing, is to have an incredible giant grid of things working together. Um, so he has palace rising, George R. R. Martin, in Gemini, the sign of writing. So of course he does. Of course he can do it. He's got it all in here. I read recently that he's saying, I could go on. You know, why are they stopping the tea? I have more stuff. I've got more ideas. And of course, he's got endless ideas. Um, the thing about, you know, and what, one thing that it's worth asking yourself, well, I ask myself, is what's the difference between a Mercury idea and an, an Athena idea, a palace idea? Uh, a Mercury idea is a fast, it's quick, it's, uh, it's a flash, you know? Mm. Athena idea is the structure things. It's like, if you know, have, do you know that scene in The Matrix when suddenly he sees what the matrix is. Yeah. That's more of Pallas Athena, is to suddenly see the matrix. Um, and that's the vision that she can give you. So you're, you're thinking, oh, come on, who else has got this? But I can, Tolkien has got Pallas in Aquarius, trying his midheaven in Gemini, of course. Yeah. So he's made, created this whole world. You find that the, the writers tend to have Pallas in air signs. Um, so, and I think she works quite well in air, I've got to say. Um, so, J.K. Rowling, now, J.K. Rowling's birth time, I didn't have, but I looked it up recently, and someone has found it, and says, okay, so that, you know, someone, not sure who, says that it's 15 degrees of Aquarius. If it's 15 degrees of Aquarius, because apparently she said on Twitter that she's got Aquarius rising, if it's that is the case, then she has got Pallas on the Ascendant. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if any of you have seen her grids that she did for how she planned Harry Potter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're incredible. It's all like little tiny handwritten notes. And I, it's, I've seen them. I thought, oh, that's very Virgo. And I think she has got stuff in Virgo. But the actually having those grids. And also, Harry Potter came to her. The whole story came to her when she was sitting on a train. Mm -hmm. So it was like the Matrix, boom, it rolled out. You know, she suddenly saw the whole thing and she saw deep into the future. How many Harry Potter books are there, seven? seven. Yeah. She saw seven to the end of the seventh book, she saw. And that's the, the sight that I'm talking about, the, the vision that Athena can give you. 